Do you believe in little green men? And do you also believe that there's a monster in Loch Ness and a beast on Bodmin Moor? You do? Good! Because this story is so strange, so incredible, so downright bizarre, it makes the X-Files look like Blue Peter. Our Fortean fable begins back in the dark days of the war with the most famous and beautiful of all warbirds, the Spitfire. What made it such a sensation was its fabulous engine, 27 litres of supercharged Rolls-Royce V12, the Merlin. This charismatic engine ruled the skies for two decades. According to an Arthurian legend, in our hour of direst need, Merlin would return to save us. And, in a way, he did. Fast forward to the 60s, and Epsom engineer John Dodd, who was asked to build a gearbox for a very special car. A car with a Merlin engine. Paul Jameson, an engineer, built the car, had problems gearing it for the road, and that's when my dad got involved. Um, he designed an automatic gearbox for it, and next thing, he bought it off him as a rolling shell. Uh, we then took it down to uh, Biggin Hill Runway and got about 180 out of it, open cockpit, so that was quite, uh, quite exciting. And um, it was in the Guinness Book of Records for being the most powerful car on the road at the time. And he used to do his testing out in Germany because of you know, the speed limits on the old autobahns. Um, and one day, he passed this German Baron in his Porsche, and next thing, Rolls-Royce get a phone call from him saying, I want your latest model. So that are rather upset them a bit. This is the third incarnation of the car. That original body was destroyed in a fire, but the beast refused to die. And each time John Dodd rebuilt it, he replaced the Rolls-Royce grill with inevitable consequences. They summoned him to court, I'm afraid. Uh, but he decided to go to court in the beast itself. And uh, he even contrived to uh, break down in Fleet Street right in front of all the uh, press offices so that they'd come down and take some nice shots of it. <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, it leaded to them banning him from driving it again. Tribute to British engineering, and uh, I feel that it's better than a Rolls Royce. Much better. Predictably, the judge was not amused. In fact, he accused John of having a cavalier attitude towards the whole proceedings. So, taking him at his word, the next day, John arrived at court on a white horse. You think I'm kidding? I'm not and things are about to get even weirder. In a move less evocative of the Camelot of King Arthur and more in tune with the antics of an East End crime lord, John took himself and the car off to the extradition-free Spanish costas. And it seems quite fitting that the car should end up in the company of men with names like Knuckles and Big Louie. But now the beast is back, minus the contentious chrome work, but with everything else intact and ready to roar once more. You could, if you wanted to, drive this outrageous vehicle on the road. Look, it's text and MOT'd. Pop down the shops for a pint of milk and a paper. But, well, you might not want to. Consider this. The 27-litre Merlin engine requires eight pints of fuel every minute. That's two miles to the gallon. If it needs an oil change, it could cost you £500, but only if you stick to the cheap stuff. And it's 19 feet long, weighs two and a quarter tons, and has no power steering. So parking can be a bit tricky. No, if you want to unleash the awesome power of the beast and get this, 2,650 RPM in top equates to 200 miles per hour, then what you need is an airfield. A bit like this one. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Is there anything uh, we need to do on here? Check no. oil pressures or...? Well, we'll do all that inside. We've got all the dials and instruments and gauges and... Yeah, uh, yeah. Is that a dipstick over there? It's, <laughs> it certainly is. It takes 25 gallons, this one. It's got a wet sump, uh, so 25 gallons it takes. So quite expensive for an oil change. Right, well, let's get me in the, uh, I suppose it's the cockpit, isn't it? Yeah, let's go, yeah. Right. Ooh. OK. It's a bit snug, isn't it? Yeah. Such a big car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First thing... Seatbelt. 
Oh, don't worry about seatbelts. Airbag? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Early stuff, that, isn't it? This is old school. <laughs> Just, uh... Scary. Put the ignition on. Ignition on. Put the magnetos on, twin magnetos. Twin magnetos. That's right. Okay, now one of our fuel pumps. Fuel pumps, how many? Uh, there's one fourth in. One there. Uh, then we want our boost pumps on. Boost pumps on. <laughs> then we need to prime the engine, which is the yes. third one in. Third one in. Prime one. it for 10 seconds. Prime it. That's it. About 10 seconds. And then hit your starter. I don't know if I dare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chucks away for a gentle jaunt down the runway at Duxford, spiritual home of the Spitfire. You know, most people who go out to buy a night of spare car with an automatic gearbox usually plug for the turbo diesel option, but not this guy. No, instead, he thought that what you need is 27 litres of V12 Merlin power! <laughs> And no wonder, it's got 850 horsepower, although the supercharged version in the Spitfire was rated at 1400. So the car's a bit limp, really. Great story, isn't it? A very British story. Some of it's even true. And of course, some of it isn't. Technically, it's not a Spitfire engine, and never was. But what the heck? You know what this is? It's a folly. It's one man's whim built without rhyme or reason and hang the consequences. I thought it'd scare me stupid, but it didn't. Beast, it's just a big old pussycat. 